Once upon a time, there was a village in a valley run by the best basket makers in the world. They used their skills for so many things, thatched roofs to keep the heat in and keep the cold out, knots to manage the community's budget. Their threads could hold back the force of an entire army. Indeed, even the wall surrounding the village was created by their weavings. It withstood floods, earthquakes, storms, and armies. It was said that the first weavers were the fates themselves. Each year, just before the first sprouts of reeds, the villagers would gather together in the valley to celebrate and ask the fates for a prosperous harvest, to bless their hands and their lands. However, as the centuries passed, fewer and fewer people passed on the knowledge as more and more villagers sought other means of work. Not everyone could be a basket maker after all. Some took up farming, others metallurgy, and still others found means of extracting energy from the land. The village kept celebrating each spring, but the women, the weavers of the village, who led the rites, who led the society, seemed to grow older by the year. Soon, as the machines took place of looms, they stopped celebrating at all. The woven wall still stood, however, though neglected and frayed to protect the village year after year. One year, a young warrior named Fletcher was hired to stand guard by a local company, Hex Energy. He was an outsider, not of the village, and when he passed by the great woven wall, he found it curious. He found most of the valley quite curious. His people were hunters from far across the mountains that surrounded the valley. He was more used to the ways of the forest than that of the plow or drill. But Fletcher needed money, and so he wandered into the valley to find work. He settled in with the locals quickly enough. He stayed with an old woman way to the back of the village, pressed up against the far side of the woven wall, whose eyesight was poor and hands were as knotted as the beautiful tapestries she wove. His days were filled with the mechanical thrumming of machinery delving deep into rock and soil and clay, and his nights were filled with the old woman's humming and the click-clack of the loom that she used with a deft mobility that defied her age. Every morning, Fletcher would return from work as the sun rose, and the old woman would ask him about his day, or rather night. Every response was merely the same. Quiet, save for the whirring of the machinery that dug deep into the earth. His days, too, were the same, as he slept to the click-clack of the loom during the day. The sound, he felt, seeped into his dreams. He perhaps should go to the village physician for tinnitus. He felt some days as though his waking and sleeping were being done in a trance, bookended by the regular mechanical sounds of the drill and loom. One morning, he came home from work and the old woman was not at her loom as she normally was. She was in the kitchen, sitting hunched and quiet at the table, looking out at the dingy window that faced the woven wall. Are you well? Fletcher asked. A storm is coming. Fletcher nodded. He had felt the change of the air as well. He was glad that some people still paid attention to such things instead of relying on the weather service. Will you work tonight? Yes, but I will be given shelter if that's the case. Come sit with me a while this morning before you sleep, will you? There is breakfast in the fridge. Fletcher was tired from a long night of work, but... He obliged the kind old woman who had given him a place to sleep, though he was a stranger to this land. He took out the bread and cheese from the fridge and settled down across the table. The fates wove that wall, you know. Really? Is that the story? Oh, hush, it's not a story. It's the truth. The fates live at the top of the highest peak. They were the very first weavers and taught our village leaders the craft. We used to bid them return each year. There, you see beyond the wall. 
we called to them to bless our woven wall, and they did. No army, nor storm, nor landslide could break the wall, should it ever fall. Should it ever fall. They told us we would have to send someone brave to bargain with the fates again. The matriarch of my family told me, and she was the last one who helped maintain the wall. Gods know how that knowledge was lost to me long before I was interested in weaving myself. Seems a bit of a strange way to protect the village. Why not replace it with something sturdier, like stone, metal, concrete? The wall is blessed by the fates. But my aunt said the reeds that were used to mend the wall were uprooted long ago to make way for the energy company. When I was a girl, I, I saw those old reeds. They were five times the height of the tallest man, as tall as trees. Fletcher was skeptical about this. Fletcher was skeptical about this, at least the fate's part. It was just a wall, afraid, molding one at that. But uh, some things must snap in order to click into place, I suppose. Oh, oh, I see you're not interested in the ramblings of some old woman. No, no, I am. It, it is interesting. Come, 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 eat your breakfast and sleep. You have work in the evening. Fletcher did as he was told, finished his breakfast, and headed off to bed. He fell asleep to silence, however, as the old woman stayed at the kitchen table, staring out the window and at the wall woven with its sti- staring out the window and at the wall woven with extinct reeds. Storm clouds were beginning to roll in when he arose that evening, the sky dimming prematurely as the sun dipped below the horizon. Fletcher went to bid the old woman farewell, but she had fallen asleep at the kitchen table. It worried him slightly. It was out of character for her to be so tired, without weaving at all. So Fletcher took one of the beautiful blankets and draped it over her shoulders. It was going to be a cold night. Fletcher took his bag and walked outside of the wall. It wasn't too far, just up the valley a ways and towards a tall electrical fence that protected the drilling site. The company's logo, a huge honeycomb design, loomed over him as he approached the main gate. He changed guard with his fellow Hex Energy employee and got settled for the night, just as the first rumble of thunder echoed through the valley. He walked the rounds through the facility, eager to finish patrol before the rain started. He managed to duck back into the security box by the front gate just as the first fat drops began to splatter on his work jacket. He settled in to watch the monitors instead and allowed his brain to relax, the whirring of the drill and the patter of the rain lulling him into a familiar trance. He thought it was thunder. A strange thunder. Until... Fletcher bolted out of his seat, which was bucking underneath him like a wild horse. He stumbled outside. Was it safe to be inside? He didn't know. He had heard of earthquakes, but this valley was not known for them, at least not regularly, aside from the stories. The screaming, though. The screaming was coming from the village. Abandoning his posts, Fletcher ran towards the village. As lightning struck, and as he grew closer, he saw the horror laid before him in the valley. The wall had fallen. Whether destroyed by the earthquake or the resulting landslide, it was unclear. But what was clear was that both reed and soil had fallen in a monstrous path that led straight to the old woman's home. His home. Fletcher's lungs burned and his feet were lead, but he could not stop until he got to the mound of rock, mud, and grass that used to be the home at the edge of the village. The other villagers were already there and, and warned him back. Who knew if there could be aftershocks? 
they needed to evacuate. But Fletcher bid them no mind and clawed his way through what what used to be the kitchen window. He found her there, underneath the rubble. The old woman, breathing her last breaths. Leave me here. No, don't worry. The ambulance is on its way. Just hold on. No. Leave me here. <coughs> Find the fates. You know the pathways in the mountains. You'll be poor hunters. <coughs> you are our only hope to find the fates. <coughs> this is their fault. They must fix it. Forget about the fates. I need to get you out of here. Promise me, Fletcher. Promise me you will find them. You will make them promise to fix this. Fix. promise and with that the old woman passed away Fletcher kept digging wild and determined someone he didn't know who pulled him away it was fruitless and the structure was threatening to swallow him too his strength soon left him and there was nothing to recover tears burned stinging rivers down his face as he viewed the destruction before him The wall, the wall that stood for centuries, perhaps more, the wall that the old woman had kept vigil over even unto her death, had fallen just as she did. The fates have abandoned us, someone in the crowd cried. We should have replaced that stupid old thing decades ago. This is the village council's fault. Well, Hex could have funded us better. We could have directed funds to assess the danger of the earthquakes. We don't have earthquakes out here. This is their fault. Have you not heard the dangers of fracking? As the crowd expressed their grief, even as they raged against the horrors, Fletcher walked away. This was not his village, after all. It was not his place. But he had to go. He had to fulfill his promise. If the wall fell, the village must send someone to bargain with the fates. If the fates did exist, he would do the old woman one better. He would kill them. Landslide, part two, coming soon. This is Lisa Alvarez, creator of Tales from the Hearth and this story. Apologies for the long delay. It has been a busy spring, but I wanted to let everyone know, all you listeners out there, that uh, we are also working on other projects, including the Ortiz Twins Are Coming Home. You may have seen this across our, your feeds, whether it's the trailer or or uh, information about our premiere party that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Well, we are doing a couple more, including one today, um, uh, March. Oh boy, what day is today? March uh, 20th. <laughs> That's today. We're doing it one today at the Tacoma Park Library in Washington, D.C. Um, we're also doing another one in, on April 10th at Mount Pleasant. Uh, library in Washington, D.C., which is it's going to be an audio drama pop-up, which I'm really excited to try out this form of connecting to community and sharing the fun nature of audio drama for the rest of my community. If you'd like to attend, it is free. Obviously, it's a local library. Please, you are invited to bring your 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 yourself, your friends, your kids. Um, uh, and the first episode of the Ortiz Twins Are Coming Home will be available during these pop-ups. But you can also watch and listen on our YouTube channel. And soon, uh, we'll we will also have our. Uh, podcast feed available. So stay tuned for that. The Ortiz Twins Are Coming Home crowdfund 
uh, is running through the end of April. So if you want to support uh, another show being made within the Stormfire Productions world, please head over to OrtizTwins.com to learn more. We have a couple of really awesome perks, including a custom screen, uh, silk screen print of artwork made by a local art company. So we're excited to partner with artists across um, the country, across the world, um, including Mexico. And uh, we want to make sure that we are including and inviting our community to join in. Thank you again for listening and for supporting small local storytellers. Um, uh, and we hope that you enjoy this story as well as the landslide. Uh, again, like I said, the second this will be a three-parter much like the seamstress um who wove the moon so please stay tuned this is something that is going to be a little bit more loosey-goosey when it's going to be um uh, produced we'll also have additional interviews um through this year so this is 2024 is already gearing up to be pretty busy <laughs> Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you or hear from you soon.